Welcome back to the heat. The United Nations says Haiti has received more than 80% of the about $12 billion pledged by more than 50 countries and multilateral agencies since the disaster. This week, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon remembered the 102 UN personnel who died in the quake and called on the international community for continued support. Joining us from Miami is Eduardo Gamara. He's authored several books and written dozens of articles about Latin America and the Caribbean. Here in our Washington, D.C. studio is Robert McGuire. He is recognized as a leading U.S. expert on Haiti. And joining us from New York is Jean-Pierre Louis, the founder of the nonprofit organization CapraCare, which brings health and medical services to Haitians. Eduardo, let me start with you this time. And, you know, it's been five years since that earthquake. The World Bank's envoy to Haiti, uh, Mary Barton Dock, she says that since the disaster, there's been tangible economic progress and poverty reconstruction, but significant challenges remain. Is that a good characterization of where the recovery effort lies right now? Yes, I think it's a very accurate characterization. Uh, I think, you know, this is really a, a, a very uh, acute observation of what has been happening in, in Haiti. Uh, and, you know, in, in the context of the political crisis that we that we addressed in the first part of this of this program, uh, you know, when you think about uh, where Haiti was in in, in, in 2010, and, and especially when you look at the reconstruction of Port-au-Prince, you know, and I think those of us who, who who go to Haiti on a regular basis perhaps are, are more acutely aware of the differences that are, that have, that have taken place. So. In a sense, what you have and what you have had over the last three years is reconstruction, uh, massive uh, uh, infrastructure development, um, a whole new road structure. Uh, you have uh, uh, infrastructure in, in several areas of the country. Uh, and, and something that w what I think is very, very important, this is probably the first government that actually enacted some social policy. Uh, you know, probably the first government, really, in the in the uh, since since the exit of Duvalier, and Duvalier didn't have any real social policy. So this is really the first time that you can see something akin to social policy. So uh, when you look at macroeconomic stability and economic growth, also Haiti has has experienced economic growth. Now, as the World Bank official says, is it sufficient? Certainly not. Uh, could it have been much better? Of course it could have. And, and that's where I think, you know, the debate is. Um, and, and so, you know, overall, I think uh, if you look at, at Haiti, I think, you know, it's better to look at what has been accomplished in the context of, of you know, that horrible starting point than to, than to simply dismiss any kind of, of progress, uh, which I think has been the tendency, unfortunately, on the part of most media. And Robert, what is your view on the reconstruction and recovery effort? I mean, is there still a big international presence in Haiti? Well, I, there is, but um, you know, many of my uh, economist friends at the university speak of something called an aid bubble. And I think much of what we've seen in Haiti over the past three or four years is the result of that bubble. And the question is, will the bubble burst? And with organizations moving away and aid amounts diminishing, um, then perhaps we'll see a when sort of... When you say down. aid bubble, you mean there's too much aid going in, or...? Uh, yeah. Well, the, the, the money going in creates kind of this bubble that right. can burst, um, like a housing bubble kind right. of thing. Um, so one of my concerns is, Eduardo mentioned the social programs, and, and I think Martelli's programs are a vast improvement over Duvalier's social programs, which consisted basically of throwing money out of a moving car. But... Right. Um, much of, of what Martelli calls a social program is the distribution of patronage, and much of that is funded out of the Petrocaribe funds that are coming in. It's, it's one of the largest sources of unadulterated funding that the government of Haiti has at its disposal, of roughly 400 million a year is the figure I've seen. And of course, we've been reading a lot lately of, of given the Venezuelan government's problems, that the uh, largesse from Petro Caribe may be diminishing, and I believe that already in Port-au-Prince the construction of various government ministries has slowed down or stopped because of the, the limited funding coming in from the Petro Caribe. So this could be another area where we see a kind of a slowdown of, of what many have seen as the visible progress of Haiti's reconstruction. Jean-Pierre, in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, of course, we had something like one and a half million people who were left homeless. Then we had that major cholera outbreak. Uh, what progress has been made in dealing with that outbreak and dealing with rehousing the homeless? 
Well, there have been a lot of um, um, educations that have happened since the cholera outbreak. Um, we have a lot of organizations that have taken that uh, initiative to empower the communities and teach them about so therefore they can be calm about this whole situation. I mean, it has been a lot of stuff. It's just, you know, like um, one of the guests mentioned, as you go through all the obstacles and all those challenges, there have been many successes. But the bottom line is, as long as you continue to have folks who are still have their basic needs who have not been met, you're still going to have this kind of struggle. And, and at the end of the day, this is all about the people, you know, having a chance, having a hope, you know, to, uh, to move on, to better their lives. So folks want to see that. And from my experiences with hands-on in the community, that's what people want to see. They want to see that change to come directly to their home. So all that aid money that folks often talk about, you know, where I'm coming from, people always question, you know, it hasn't reached home yet. It hasn't reached them yet. So that's been part of the struggle for a lot of folks. And what we're hoping right now is, you know, as the struggle continues and as people, you know, making their best efforts from, from everyone, from like, you know, organizations like Kappa Care to the government to other um, active, you know, um, players who are trying to push this effort is that we hope that this won't be a setback, but this will actually be a pivot to a um, better outcome. That's what the folks are looking for, and that's what I'm here to, you know, also as a you know, um, stakeholder in our country that we are looking at from the Jasper's perspective as well. Right, Eduardo, and that's a point made by critics in Haiti as well. They say, for instance, that uh, a lot of the money uh, is not being controlled by Haitians, that it's been controlled completely by international aid donors, they should have a say on right. how that money is being spent. I mean, do they have a point? Uh, they have a very good point. And, and, you know, again, this goes back to the, the perception that all governments in Haiti have been corrupt and therefore, uh, especially American assistance and European assistance is supposed to be channeled through NGOs. But even the GAO, uh, the American, you know, uh, Congress's branch uh, that investigates how funds are dispersed, has concluded that somewhere between 75 cents of every American dollar uh, and 80 cents of every American dollar that was invested in Haiti, in fact, went you know straight into uh, consultants. It went into you know uh, overhead costs. It went into uh, uh, so-called Beltway Bandit organizations that worked in Haiti. But you know most of that didn't really remain in Haiti. And I think this is, in fact, uh, Prime Minister Lamont had a. Uh, had made a, a, a real effort at trying to address this question with with the Europeans and with the Americans and fi figuring out you know how can we work on on on, uh, on a different model of, uh, of assistance that uh, that in a way you know uh, uh, trickles down more to to Haiti and this is why going back to Bob McGuire's point especially about Petro Caribe you know Petro Caribe didn't have those those uh, those restrictions it was just basically you know giving money to Haiti and trusting the Haitians to uh, uh, to spend it and they nine out of every ten projects in Haiti are Venezuelan funded Bob's concerns notwithstanding, you know, I think we really need to look at how American assistance is dispersed in the context of countries like Haiti. If I could uh, jump in there. Go ahead. Um, and, and I think many good points have just been made by, by the two uh, preceding speakers. And, uh, but this goes into a bigger picture of the reform of aid effectiveness. Um, Rajiv Shah, who is stepping down uh, at the end of this month as the USAID director, has set a goal that 19 percent of USAID funding going into Haiti should now try to go to Haitian organizations. That's a very small amount. So much of that money yep. is, is lost between Washington and the people who are the intended beneficiaries by those who capture it along the way. So, right. you know, when, when Haitian people see, you know, these billion dollar sums of aid, they expect to see something that will come into their lives. And the reality is they see very little of that that Very affects good. them personally. Right, and the point that Eduardo makes is that a lot of that money makes the round trip, leaves Washington, comes Absolutely. back to Washington. The other thing, Robert, is that, uh, you know, sometimes aid organizations may have the best of intentions, but on the ground it doesn't work out the way they intended. I mean, for example, you know, there's a housing project in Haiti, mm -hmm. but all these houses built, they're standing empty because there's no infrastructure, there's no water supply, there's no electricity. You have a South Korean a project built an industrial park very far away from the people who are affected right. by the earthquake. Uh, aren't these missed opportunities? There are many missed opportunities, um, starting with the fact that at the time of the earthquake, some 600,000 Haitians left Port-au-Prince, but they went back to the countryside, which has been underinvested for decades. 
Port-au-Prince has been the center of all investment virtually in Haiti, right. and that has continued. But I want to take an example here of something else. Um, earlier this week, the State Department put out a release that some 77,000 farmers have been assisted by U.S. assistance since the earthquake in improving their crop harvest. This is very, very important. However, if you look a little bit beneath that, you see that this was done as a result of development projects funded by USAID to the tune of more than $100 million. And you just have to wonder, what is the sustainable aspect of this once the money stops, once the AID contractor goes away, and you know the, the entire infrastructure that's been established is no longer funded? So the issue would be, how would you channel that funding instead of to an NGO based in Washington that's going to capture so much of that money in the first instance to a Ministry of Agriculture in Haiti who can make it probably go a lot further and make it sustain itself. This has been a huge development right. challenge in Haiti and in part because the government of Haiti has not been trusted rightly or wrongly. All right, we are going to have to end it there. Gentlemen, thanks to all of you for joining us. That's all the time we have for, but the conversation continues. Join us on CCTV America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show, or chat with us on Twitter at uh, CCTV underscore America. I'm Arnold Nido in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.